Um, and so, yes, so thank you all for coming out um, for this last of our September programming. Um, with Dave Gavatsky, we are very excited that we convinced him to to do this program. Um, so we get to be the the maiden voyage here. Um, before I hand things over to Dave, I do want to take a moment to thank our nature program series sponsors, um, Hancock Lumber and Ragged Mountain Equipment, for their support of our programming. Um, if you, um, we would love support from our viewers as well. Um, if you are not a member of Tin Mountain, um, considering joining uh, is a great way and the best way to support us. Um, but also just, you know, contributing five or $10, uh, donating to our nature program series is also um, greatly appreciated. And if you got our email link with the program, um, there is a button right at the bottom that says contribute. You can also find that on uh, right on our website as well. Um, also, we have this is a jam packed week for Tin Mountain uh, with programming. So we have uh, obviously our, our Tuesday program this evening um, and then followed by this coming Thursday, I believe that is the 1st of October, we have Chris Louie is doing a virtual hawk program. So his hawk talk, um, and that is going to be followed on Saturday by a hawk watch. Um, and that is an in-person field program that's gonna be held up at Hackers Hill in Casco, Maine, which is a, a nice, open summit that you can easily socially distant and drive to the top of. So, um, and we will be meeting to caravan over there at Freiburg Academy. Um, if that's something that you're interested in, do give us a call at Tin Mountain. Um, and then next week we have um, our mushroom program. So on Thursday, October 8th, we have um, our research director, Rick Vanderpool, will be presenting his you know, Edible and Toxic Mushrooms of New England program. That's a virtual evening program. Um, for those who are interested um, on um, Sunday, October 11th, we have two different field sessions um, for to go on a walk with, him, um, with Dave. With walk with Dave. A walk with Rick to do some mushroom identification. And I believe that there is um, a 9 to 10.30 a.m. session, and then an 11 to 12.30, and those two require reservations so that we're able to keep those group sizes safe and small. But again, you can contact Tin Mountain if you have questions about either of those. And I actually left out, because it is a darn jam-packed week. Um, on Friday, we are actually doing a, um, this coming Friday, October 2nd, we are doing a paddle at Keezer Pond. Um, and it's starting at 9 a.m. So again, um, if that's something you're interested in, you can contact us at Tin Mountain. So lots of things going on this fall, um, lots of ways that we hope that you interact and join us. Um, but tonight we are very lucky to have one of our, one of our favorite presenters, um, Dave Gavatsky here to present on the science of autumn colors, which really are, you know, we're are hitting our stride right now and hopefully we'll have something left come Thursday morning. All right, so I am going to hand things over to, um, to David. One thing I will, I will ask of you is that um, if you could go ahead, unless you are David, uh, if you want to go ahead and mute yourselves, that way we don't pick up any background sound. Um, and then if you do have a question, um, you can type it directly into the chat feature and I will be monitoring that. Um, if it's immediate clarifying question, I will I jump in and interrupt David. Otherwise, um, we'll hold them to the end. We'll do question, you, you, and again, you can type it into the chat feature or you can save your question until the end and ask it directly of David. But otherwise, um, I'm gonna go ahead and hand things over to him. Okay.
Thanks, Nora. And I think I can, ready to turn it over? Yes, you should just, I, you, okay. should to share, you should just be able to screen share right now. Okay, can you see the screen with the title um, slide? Not yet, no. Okay. How about now? No. Hold on, let me, uh, I'll back up and try that again. I can see it now. Oh, you can? Okay. I can't. Oh, I can't well, see. I can't see your presentation, David. Okay, hold on. I couldn't see it, nor. Can you see it? It's a, it's a title slide? No, I am still seeing the, um, I'm still seeing just the gallery view of all of our presenters. It okay. doesn't look like you have screen shared yet. Okay, hold on here. I will hit share screen and um, desktop one. Hold on. Okay, hold on. Okay, here we go. Let's try this. Desktop one. And Well, this is an unusual situation here. Um, I'm going to hit share screen again. Ah, I think we got it. Yeah, we, I, it, yes, David, I think that, here we go. I can see your computer screen right now. Well, that's good. <laughs> and I'm going to slide that over. I'm sorry for that. Okay, I'm gonna reduce this to just that. All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, my background, I'm a forester and a silviculturist and I love trees and I love autumn. It is really my favorite time of, of the year. Um, and did you know that orange is the official color of autumn? I guess uh, somebody, somebody figured that out and uh, decided that orange it is. And uh, Nora, can, is my sound okay? Um, yeah, but if you want to turn your, um, if you want to turn your video off just to, to save bandwidth, I think that is fine. Okay. Okay, we got it there. All right. Okay. It's a unique spectacle here in the Northeast. There's, uh, there's a number of factors here, and it's primarily the tree species, the latitude that we're at, the amount of daylight that we have at this time of year, um, even the soils and the mineral content and the amount of moisture that we get to really create the right conditions for, for autumn foliage. And there's really nowhere else in the world that has the intensity the scale and the length of the foliage season as we have here in the northeastern United States and southeastern Canada. And I've, I've worked in Colorado. I lived there for two years and it's wonderful aspen foliage there. And I've lived in Oregon and Washington where they, where they do have some foliage, some of the maples that are there. Um, and in the south, um, you know, Kentucky and places, and they have foliage and, and the Smokies and and so forth, but there's really nothing like New England because of our, our sugar maples and some of the other species of trees that we have. And so it's this, this grand mix of colors and it's the yellows and reds and oranges and purples and even the greens that we have. And, uh, and some people don't realize that uh, even conifers have color uh, in the autumn. And uh, for instance, white pine 
loses a certain percentage of its needles every year and they turn yellow. It's not the things that we really focus on because green and yellow is yeah, pretty close. Whereas the reds and the, and the, and the yellows and the purples are, are just more outstanding. So let's have a look at some objectives here in this uh, three hour present, wait, one hour presentation here. I guess there's a debate or something tonight too. So um, why do leaves change color and the factors that influence the leaf color? the pigments that are responsible for these colors, and what's the significance of leaf color change, and uh, economic and health benefits of foliage, and where are some of the best places to see color. And I'll try to answer some of the effects of climate change we'll have on leaf color. We'll start off with, you know, where are some good places to go? And I think many of you already know that we have a system of scenic byways in New Hampshire and, and in Maine, and in Vermont. Um, the White Mountain Trail, which is about a hundred miles long, and I know some of you have even bicycled that, um, using the Kankamaugus Highway and Route 302, uh, Baronach Road, uh, for instance, and, and Route 3, and then back down through Franconia Notch is a wonderful trip. Uh, going up through Pinkham Notch and and through Randolph and Jefferson, there's some wonderful color. And going up into Dixville Notch and in Lake and Bagog in that area is, is really quite pretty too. But there's other roads, lesser known roads like the Sandwich Notch Road. Just make sure you have a car with pretty good clearance on that. Don't do it on a weekend, but there are some beautiful fall foliage to be seen on the Sandwich Notch Road, which uh, starts in Waterville Valley and ends in, in Sandwich. Uh, so do we call it autumn or do we call it fall? I, I, I guess being a naturalist, I, I kind of go with autumn because the derivation from the Latin is autumnus and it really denotes the passing of the year. And the French, uh, they have a derivation of the Latin word autumne. And uh, in England, and of course we're settled mostly by, you know, uh, English settlers originally, and they, they had a term in Middle English and also in Norse uh, that was called fall. Uh, so that denotes the falling of the leaf and they have, they really came up with spring too, which is the spring of the leaf. So that's a, that's an interesting thing. I go with autumn. I, I like the word um, uh, more than I do fall. So I, I do with that. Officially, at least um, astronomically, autumn starts with the autumnal equinox, which is uh, supposedly when you have equal hours of, of uh, day and equal hours of night. And it's pretty close. It's this year was September 22nd. Uh, I typically go with the meteorological fall, which is September 1st through November 30th. So it's a little bit different, but uh, so you have a choice between astronomical or meteorological seasons. And one thing I kind of signify, and it, it's a plant, it's one of my favorite flowers, actually, it's fireweed. Um, it, it, to me, it signifies the, the end of summer. And on the same stem, you could have at the top of the plant, because it flowers from the bottom up, you could have the buds, and below that, you can actually have the flowers uh, that are already flowering, and then the seed pods, and then the seeds on the same stalk. So for me, it's when, the feathery seeds that are at, start at the bottom and work their way up to the top, that's when it's autumn. So that's my uh, classification there. It's a gorgeous time of the year. And here's a picture of some witch hazel, which uh, interesting shrub that flowers at this and also fruits at this time of the year at my favorite covered bridge in all of the world, I guess. I was gonna say, New Hampshire, but I can't think of a better bridge that I like better than the Albany Covered Bridge uh, off the Kankamaugus Highway. Uh, and that's a beautiful place to go during autumn foliage. So there's a lot of health benefits of autumn foliage. And I mean, who cannot smile looking at these, um, uh, the bowl of Fruit Loops that you have on a mountainside, the colors that are there, everyone seems to be happy and polite. Uh, as opposed to a prolonged period of, uh, say, snow or, or, or rain where some people get a little bit cranky. But there's obviously a lot of benefits of people getting out and bicycling and walking on the trails and, uh, and just enjoying the outdoors because it is such a glorious 
time of the year. And you, you never know what you're going to see coming around the corner of some of these scenic byways or these back roads that we have. That's some other beautiful uh, color that's, uh, that's out there. And it is a kaleidoscope of colors that are ever changing. And, uh, and you get up high in the mountains and you can really see uh, the beautiful colors that, that are occurring. And of course, tourism, vital to the New Hampshire economy. And it's amazing how many people that come up to see fall foliage. And, and for about 12 years, I've been doing programs at various hotels for um, the people that wanted to see our, our foliage. And they were coming from Australia, New Zealand, Europe, and other parts of the country. Occasionally, we'd even get people from you know, Connecticut, Massachusetts, who, who just enjoyed it too, a, a guided tour. And, and it's so important. It's our second um, biggest industry in New Hampshire. And uh, typically, I mean, I don't know what it's going to be like this year in a year of COVID, but it generates about $1.8 billion from about 8 million visitors each year. And I know that it, it's sometimes hard to see all of these cars and, and buses and motor coaches that are on the roads, but you know, that's, that's a lot of money that it generates for um, our businesses in our rooms and meals taxes. And, um, and people are enjoying it, having a good time. So I welcome them. And I, I hope that you welcome our visitors too and show them a little bit about what uh, New Hampshire has to offer. And of course, you know, speaking of the, you know, commercial aspects, we have uh, uh, Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts and, uh, and the other shops have their pumpkin spice latte that you can get. I'm not a particular fan of that, nor uh, a pumpkin beer. I've had that from um, North Woodstock, but uh, I'm not really into that. I do like pumpkin pie though. Uh, but it is a time that you, know, you can celebrate the harvest. And this is something my wife makes. It's a Halloween salad and you know, just celebrating this time of the year with the colors again the carrots for the, for the hair and the uh, half boiled, uh, half of a boiled egg for the, for the face and carrots and, and other bits of fruit and cottage cheese and chicken salad. So uh, something to make you hungry right now. So the question is, how does weather affect uh, autumn color? Well, hurricanes are a bad idea. Even strong winds are a bad idea, but if what you need are warm, sunny days and cool, crisp but not freezing nights that's what produces the most spectacular colors that we get so the key warm sunny days and cool crisp nights so lots of sugar or really glucose uh, is produced during these warm sunny days and the sugars are trapped in the leaves and that's what produces this brilliant red pigment the anthocyanin pigment and uh, gives you the reds the purples and the crimson so what we want is a warm, wet spring, which we had, uh, favorable summer weather, which we did not have because we're in a pretty serious drought, and sunny autumn days. We, we did have that and cool nights that produced the most brilliant color. Unfortunately, we had some frost and it's done a fair amount of damage to um, particularly yellow birch and uh, paper birch leaves. They've, they're kind of crinkly on the, on the trees, but still we're having a good year. So what I do every year to kind of come up with a prognostication or a forecast is to have index trees that are scattered around that I go to almost on a daily basis. And this is what a sugar maple tree in Jefferson looked like in 2019. And I go back on the same day or you know, within 48 hours. And, and, and last year there was a lot more orange. This year there tends to be a lot more uh, red in the leaves and, um, and some of the leaves have, have actually blown off. So it seems to be an earlier year this year for, for colors, at least up, up here in the North Country. And let me give you a quick refresher on what photosynthesis is. And uh, essentially, in plain English, it means putting together with, with light. Plants need water, carbon dioxide, and sunlight. They get the water through the roots, and there wasn't much water this, this summer. Uh, carbon dioxide, they absorb, and we're happy to have trees absorb as much carbon dioxide as they can. So they absorb it primarily through the leaves, but also the root system. And we need sunlight, and that's absorbed by, a, you know, a chemical pigment called chlorophyll that's um, in a vessel in the, in the leaves called a chloroplast. Um, and what you get is a byproduct when you put this together, it produces oxygen. And oxygen, of course, is, is the air that we, we breathe. 
Um, chlorophyll gives you that green pigment. It, it absorbs that red and blue light and gives leaves that uh, green color. And I'm sorry about the text slides, but this is kind of a science uh, presentation. So I'll, uh, I won't have too many. I have a lot more pictures of, of trees, but uh, let me tell you where the colors of, of autumn come from. And during the growing season, chlorophyll has to be constantly being replaced because ultraviolet rays from the sun basically break it down. And so you constantly have to replenish it. And obviously, um, chlorophyll is necessary for photosynthesis and it allows plants to use the sunlight, carbon dioxide and water to manufacture sugars or glucose for their food. Now trees are storing these sugars that they've been making for the dormant period. And as night length increases, the production of chlorophyll slows down and finally stops. And what happens is, is there's a couple of pigments that are in the leaves, but they're being masked or hidden by the green chlorophyll in, until this time of the year when days are getting shorter, nights longer. So this reveals the xanthophylls, and that's a Greek word for yellow leaves. Uh, but the xanthophylls give us those yellow pigments and the carotenoids give us the, the orange pigments. And these are hidden by the green chlorophyll. And at this time, anthocyanin, the reds and the purples and the, uh, and the pinks are being produced during this period. On, uh, not on all trees, but on, on some trees. So again, chlorophyll is what gives you the, um, the green and leaves. It's being produced all summer, but, um, and again, leaves, they're solar collectors. They're collecting sun, just amazing uh, devices to, to go through this thing. But less chlorophyll is being produced as these days are getting shorter, as you can see. And again, the pigments that we have for autumn foliage, there's, there's essentially five. You know, most people say there's only three, but I include chlorophyll, which gives you the green colors because some, some of the leaves aren't, aren't turning yet and that gives you that nice mix. Uh, some people put the xanthophylls in with the carotenoids. I break them apart uh, because I think that's what science is, is basically telling us. Carotenoids give us the orange and reds and the anthocyanins give us those reds and purples. The tannins give us the browns and, uh, and it's really a, a waste product more than a pigment, but I still call it a pigment. Uh, they eat in oak leaves and, and beech leaves. So, so here's an example of, um, hey, these are red maple leaves. This is at Forest Lake State Park in Dalton, New Hampshire. We were there a couple weeks ago to go canoeing and you can see the red maple leaves. Uh, they're turning red at the tips and that's because the sugars are, uh, trapped there at the ends and, uh, and there's still photosynthesis going on in the center of the leaves because those vessels are, are still open. But as time goes on, you know, the entire leaves will become red and, uh, and, and red maple, for instance, there's two places that it, it grows really well at. One, we call them swamp maples where they're growing along the edges of swamps and streams. And then there's uh, red maple that you find on drier sites, on hillsides and, and that. And it's those swamp maples that this year started around the 25th of August. Uh, so right about that time that I'm seeing the, um, the you know, the feathery seeds of, of fireweed reaching the top, that's when the red maple is, is starting to uh, really give us that spectacular crimson red foliage. And it also reminds me that we have really three main foliage seasons. We have um, when the swamp maples, the red maples start to turn red. And then uh, the last week in uh, September, first week in October in, in the White Mountain region, we have our northern hardwoods that turn, um, you know, these multiple colors of uh, reds and oranges and, um, and greens and browns and purples. And then we have the tamarack uh, season, which starts in the middle of October. So red maple is, um, you know, quite spectacular. Uh, it's one of my favorite, my top five. I'm gonna ask you a question here shortly, what your top five trees are. And uh, I'd be curious to hear what you have to say. Uh, but, uh, but red maple, you know, you can have some of the uh, branches on a red maple that are turning red and some are still green. And, uh, and some have even, 
flown off of that. It's just a matter of how much sun and shade they get. And I was, uh, I was very uh, thankful to Nora and Donovan for getting this photograph of a black gum. I guess I should have driven down to Tin Mountain because in the uh, Michael Klein Memorial Forest, you have this amazing tree. And again, it's a, it's a wonderful tree. It turns almost a uh, rich uh, red scarlet color and these leaves turn. They're a little bit later uh, and they're still coming along, but I encourage you to make a stop uh, ask where the black gums are on the um, on, uh, Mike's uh, Memorial Forest and, and check those trees out. They're, uh, they're fabulous. Um, anthocyanins, again, that uh, red or purple pigment, um, this is a white ash. And uh, it's interesting, we have three main ashes, uh, ash trees in, in New Hampshire. Mountain ash is not not in the ash family, it's actually in the rose family. But anyways, white ash gives us this, this incredible purple color. Um, it's one of the first trees to um, turn in the year and, and lose, its, uh, lose its leaves. And it's one of the last trees in the spring to start flowering again, so it's, it's a bit unusual. But uh, white ash, you can, you can drive around and you can pick out the white ash trees very, very easily because they're purple with compound leaves. Now green ash, which is closely related, and there's not a lot of it. I don't think there's any in the White Mountains. There's some up in Arrow, and there's some in southern New Hampshire that actually just turns a yellow color. Not as nice as uh, the white ash we have here. And then brown ash, again, uh, or black ash, uh, has a tendency more to just to get uh, crinkly and yellow and, uh, and that. But White ash is, is quite spectacular. And we have a, a shrub, you may recognize this as one of the viburnums or uh, hobble bush or, or witch hobble. And that can be almost any color, it can be red or purple. And, uh, and often it has these clusters of red berries, which really adds to the festival feeling of this time of uh, year. And while not a tree, uh, I guess maybe a, several hundred years ago, maybe ferns were, classified as trees then, but the cinnamon ferns at this time of the year, you know, after they get a frost, they, they really turn this lovely, lovely brown color. I just thought I would include a few things like ferns and, and shrubs in the, in the program. Um, again, with anthocyanins, one of the uh, more spectacular colors is staghorn sumac. And this is after we had a frost, so they're a little bit on the shriveled side in our, in our backyard, but uh, but they turn a, a real rich scarlet. And these staghorn sumacs, pretty easy to transplant and birds love them and they provide this wonderful color and, uh, but they do tend to be a little bit uh, invasive and, um, and you do have to keep mowing them and their root systems have a tendency to move around. Well, sugar maple is, uh, is probably one of the top of the list for, for many people. It, it gives us this beautiful color in the fall. In the summertime, it gives us wonderful shade and the shape of the tree is beautiful. And in the, in the springtime, um, you know, many people tap sugar maple to produce maple syrup, and maple sugar, and maple uh, candy and other products like that. And of course, it makes some of the best furniture too. So sugar maple is, is the heart really of the foliage season that we have here in the White Mountains. And if we didn't have sugar maples, it would be, it would be a lot different. Sometimes they come out as a crimson color and, uh, um, and, and other times it's a mix of orange and, and reds and, uh, and yellows that you get. So here's that question. And uh, if you want, you can put it in the chat box. I wanted to ask you what your favorite autumn foliage trees are. And uh, I had to think about it because there's lots of different trees that are, that are out there. You know, or, you know, you just put down your first or second uh, favorite. Uh, and uh, there's no correct answer. We're not uh, uh, going to score you on this, but, uh, but I'd be curious to get what you particularly like. And then uh, maybe later on, Nora can tell us what those, what those are. So here's what my favorites are, and uh, maybe you can compare them with, uh, with yours. So my first is, is sugar maple, and not surprising, and then followed by red maple. But the third one may, may surprise you. It's big tooth aspen. 
I love aspen trees to begin with, and Big Tooth is really my all-time favorite of any of the several species of aspen that we have. And I do like tamarack, sometimes called larch, uh, and because in the middle of October, late October, you get this beautiful golden color and the Canada geese are flying and, and it's just wonderful. And beach, American beach, uh, I really love too. And uh, not everybody likes beach, but uh, I do. I think the colors that you get from it are, are really quite nice. So some leaves don't produce anthocyanins because there's no glucose or, or the sugar that's left in the leaves. And so they just really turn, turn yellow. This is um, striped maple or moosewood, uh, but that has almost an electric yellow color when you're walking in the woods, particularly when it's next to a fir tree or, or a hemlock. It's, it's really quite spectacular. And uh, of course, you know, there was a band, the Electric Light Orchestra. I wonder if that's where they got the, uh, the name from seeing striped maple in the woods and saying, oh, this is electric light. There was another band, well, if you like rock music, it was King Crimson. Uh, but uh, there's also a, uh, a King Crimson Norway maple. And Norway maples are an invasive species. And some, some people get the, um, the crimson red maple with the leaves. It's a, somewhat of a hybrid, are red all summer. And uh, unfortunately, when they drop their seeds and they reproduce, they, they're just green leaves and uh, they tend to take over. So let's look at quaking aspen. Quaking aspen is one of those that uh, it really turns more of a, a, a wonderful golden color, particularly when you have a blue sky uh, in the background. And go to Colorado, go to Utah, um, Wyoming, and, and when you have the snow-covered peaks and uh, aspen that are just turning golden, it's, it's just remarkable to see those. But not all aspen turns a really lovely color. And balsam poplar is boreal species, uh, pretty much on the northern part of the White Mountains, all the way up into the Arctic. It really turns a you know fairly dull shade of, of of green, but it's good to know which trees are turning what color because you as you're driving along or bicycling along, you can identify trees just by the color of the autumn autumn foliage. And you probably wondered why I said you know one of my favorites, uh, the third favorite is big tooth aspen. Um, you can see those big tooth the uh, um, um, the real ridges in there, but look at that beautiful color. It's because some of the sugars are um, still in the leaves and that glucose and it, you get these anthocyanins that are uh, really turning in color. And at this time of the year, you can find these leaves that have fallen to the ground and uh, it's, they're just beautiful to me. So that's one of my favorite, uh, favorite trees. And in, in the Mount Washington Valley, northern red oak is, is much more common. And red oak gives you, uh, you know, reds and purples and mixtures of green and brown. And, uh, and that's a pretty spectacular color, too. And on the mountainside, you can often see where the oak stands are by just looking uh, at the colors after the hardwood, other hardwood leaves have, have fallen off. You can see where the northern red oak stands are. Here in Jefferson, we have a, a group of red oaks. It's about 20 acres in size. We call it the Star King Oaks because from several places in town, you can actually see this stand of, of red oak that are doing well. So what causes leaf fall? Again, it's the shorter daylight hours and that declining intensity of the sunlight that produces less and less of the chlorophyll. And the veins that carry the fluids into and out of the leaf gradually close off as a layer of cells forms at the, at the base of each uh, leaf. It's either called a separation layer or an abscission layer. Abscission is a, probably a you know, fancier word, but just call it a separation layer. So these clogged veins, they trap the sugars in the leaf. And that's what starts that production, as I've said, of anthocyanin. And once the separation layer, and that, that these cells are growing very, very rapidly, very complete, the leaf is, is ready to fall off at the slightest breeze. And as I said, for us, peak foliage occurred on Sunday at 1243 in the afternoon. Well, 
maybe not exactly, but that's when I could see leaves are really starting to fall off the trees with a breeze. And, uh, and so it peak foliage, I mean, it, it's really in the eyes of the beholder, but it's when you're really starting to see lots of, of leaves that begin to fall off. And it's a period that may last, you know, three, four days a week, uh, or matter of hours if you get a, a category three hurricane moving through. And American beach, um, at, I, I rate that as uh, number five on my favorite top five uh, trees for fall foliage in this area. You know, it starts as a wonderful green color. It slowly turns the shade of, of yellow. And then you can see there's still a little bit of green as those vessels are uh, still carrying some fluids in, but it's those tannins are giving it the brown color. Uh, and these leaves have a tendency to, to stay on the trees. And, and that process is called marcescence. And um, if you were to say, this is a marcescent leaf, and I, I know that many of you know that from taking the naturalist courses um, at Tin Mountain. So that occurs in, in beech and uh, in oak trees primarily, and in some other trees. And uh, this was a trip that uh, I think Lori and I were leading a couple years ago to see American chestnut and uh, very similar to the beach as far as the how the leaves look and uh, and hopefully someday we're going to get American chestnut to come back and uh, become a, a a tree that had the importance that it had uh, you know 50 70 years ago and my fourth favorite tree is that is what I call autumn gold um, almost sounds like a brand of uh, something you would smoke, but uh, no, it's uh, autumn gold for me is tamarack. And it, walking in a, in a forest of larger tamarack, it's, it's just an amazing experience. You, got, you just smile when you're going through there because you know, psychologists, and, uh, and I, I only had one course in college in psychology, but uh, you know, this is a mellow yellow. And, and I, I do remember from buying tents that when you had the uh, a yellow uh, tent roof, it, it just gave you that mellow experience. Even though the weather might be bad, it just uh, uh, it would it would help improve your how you felt about being outdoors in certain kinds of weather. So it is gorgeous, um, and in just a couple of weeks up in the North Country, they're already starting to turn, but uh, they they really start turning around the 15th of October on these hillsides. That's, that's Cherry Pond. All right, let's take a look at climate change and autumn foliage. And, and I'd like to say that it's you know, somewhat of a big unknown because we don't really have a good handle on all the effects. There is studies going on um, at the um, US Forest Service. They have a maple lab in the Burlington, Vermont area. And they're, they're studying the impacts because Sugar maple is, I mean, you got to admit, it's one of the most important trees that we have in New England for our economy for a number of reasons. And, uh, and but is, how is it going to affect it? And of course, we know the day length and, and temperature, as I said earlier, are the primary cues for this fall foliage. So what effect will climate change have on tree species? Are we going to get delayed color? or less anthocyanin production because we're not getting those cool nights. Um, you know, these are studies that we need to be uh, continuing and, and, and thinking about. Are we gonna be getting more exotic pests or diseases that affect our sugar maples and other trees? You know, the Asian longhorn beetle and, and other uh, pests that we might have of, um, of sugar maple. Are we going to get too much moisture, too much rain, or too little? Are we going to get these long-term droughts like they've had out west? Is the humidity level going to change? Are we going to have more smoke like we've had in the last you know, 10 days from the western wildfires? That's going to affect photosynthesis and the health of these trees. And will the waters in the Caribbean warm up to the point that we're going to get more intense hurricanes that come all the way up here into uh, northern New England and blow all these leaves down. So there's a lot of unknowns and, uh, and knowing what the unknowns are is, is good for science because they can investigate this. But uh, certainly we know more about the climate impacts on our ski areas 
the alpine areas, you know, they're able to make snow and, uh, uh, and do some other things, but it's our Nordic trails that, you know, you, you don't get snow for a long time. So there's a tendency to, to cause some problems there. So there are some adaptations that some animals and uh, use. Some animals adapt to uh, winter by migrating like this uh, monarch butterfly or Canada geese that are flying south to a uh, golf course near you. Um, and some animals adapt to winter by hibernation. I, I don't know if anyone had chipmunks in their yard this year, as many as we did, uh, but they were certainly around from last winter's uh, acorn and beechnut crop and, and cone crop. There are just so many chipmunks around, but, but they're storing food for winter and uh, getting ready for that. And of course, our, our friendly woodchuck uh, is certainly gonna be thinking about hibernating here pretty, pretty soon. Now, other animals uh, adapt by storing food, and I guess in some ways, uh, you know, we adapt by knowing winter's coming and we start to, you know, stockpile the, the basics that we need in the event of a storm or, or some other event. And these animals are, are storing their supply, about 2,000 pounds of, of wood products, these branches and, and leaves, and they stick them in the mud because in another month, we're going to be seeing that these beaver ponds are going to be freezing over where, where the beavers, the family that's in there, they snug as a bug in a, a rug here and, uh, and they've got plenty of food and they can go out and get it uh, in the wintertime. So storing wood is, is pretty important. It's pretty important for, for us. Uh, here's, here's our woodshed, got a pumpkin out there and, and you know we have this year's wood part of next year's and so we're looking at two years out that we're starting to split it. It's so much easier to split it in cold weather, it, you know, have the humidity and, and so forth, and it splits so much easier. But uh, we love uh, uh, using wood to burn wood for, for our heat. Now other animals, uh, they adapt to, uh, by changing um, color. This is a short-tailed weasel. Um, short-tailed weasels go all the way up into the Arctic, into Alaska, whereas our long-tailed weasels, they pretty much stop at the uh, Canadian border, not not because there's you know COVID nineteen rules or anything, but uh, it's more of a climate thing. They they do go into parts of southern Canada, but uh, this the short-tailed weasel turns white, becomes an ermine in the winter time, and this is wonderful camouflage uh, for them, and they can they can blend in with the snow. But you know, getting the color changes and not having snow, it, it's it that's a bit of a a problem for some of these animals, such as the snowshoe hare. This I took uh, just this, this week, um, uh, and in our, near our driveway and, uh, there's a snowshoe hair. It's just starting to turn a little bit of white around the nose and it takes about 10 weeks for them to completely turn, turn white. I, I should mention back to the ermine is that when you get south of Pennsylvania, the ermines don't turn white. They, they stay pretty much brown. And we're finding that is happening with snowshoe hair too. Um, you know, they're, it's, it's again, you know, Darwin's uh, uh, evolution process is that, you know, some of those uh, that are in areas that there's not going to be snow, they're going to stay brown year round, that, that brown pigment. But in the wintertime for snowshoe hair, they do turn white. Those hollow hairs on the snowshoe hair, they're, they trap the heat. And of course, they provide that wonderful camouflage. And, and they need that cold weather and they need that snow to survive. And then other animals are, you know, specifically adapted for cold weather. And we're right at the southern range of the Canada lynx. And this was a picture from last winter. Uh, Success, which is, if you're not familiar with Success, it's uh, just north of Berlin, New Hampshire. And uh, it's an area that had about 6,000 acres of clear cutting back in, um, I think it was the early 2000s. And uh, what ended up happening was when the trees re came back in, they grew in, there was snowshoe hair everywhere. And then we had uh, all of these Canada lynx moving in. So it's one of the best places to see Canada lynx. So these are adapted for winter by those huge paws and they're built almost like a giant snowshoe hair so they can really run. However, if we don't get the snow, you know, the effects of climate change um, and they're gonna be losing out to bobcats, which uh, have smaller paws and, and actually are a little bit more ferocious than, than their larger lynx cousins. So 
uh, we do want snow. And there's other adaptations. I took this a couple days ago, um, a spruce grouse, and, and they adapt by having uh, additional winter feathers that cover their feet. You can see them on this particular uh, grouse. This is, I took this over in Vermont. Had four spruce grouse in, in one place, which was pretty remarkable. And they also develop feathers that cover their nose. And, uh, you know, they're, in the wintertime, they're just eating black spruce needles and they, they survive. Now, pectination, and, and you can see it, if I blew this up, um, you can actually see on their, on their toes, they have these little growths that grow at this time of the year as its days are getting shorter. It's all about the amount of daylight. And these tend to act as um, in, improving their flotation on the snow. So they tend to float on the snow a little bit better with these wider snowshoe feet that they develop along with those feathers. And occasionally, um, you know, you'll get rough grouse. This is a male rough grouse underneath a crab apple tree that we have here last year. And rough grouse love crab apples and we'll have several in the tree at, at one time. And males, um, you know, they get confused. It's all, like I said, all about the amount of daylight hours and they're, they're drumming, they're strutting their stuff and getting their rough out. And, uh, and they have what's called autumn echo. And because you have the same amount of daylight now as you do in times in the spring when they're mating, um, you know, they, they think it's mating time again, or at least that's their excuse. I'm not sure it's, uh, will hold up, but uh, that's what they're doing. And, and you'll often see that. I even saw the spruce grouse that were, the males were demonstrating that. So anyways, it is a glorious time of the year to um, get outside. I, I hope that uh, you spend as, as much time as possible, even when it's, when it's, it's raining and, and cloudy weather. The clouds, as I tell people, and even the fog, it just brings out the intensity. So let me summarize here and then we can go to questions. Um, um, the best weather for autumn color is bright, sunny days, cool nights. Um, our foliage has, has incredible economic and health benefits for us. Uh, chlorophyll, the greens that we have, vital for photosynthesis. The reds, the anthocyanins are produced as sugars are trapped in the leaves at this time of year. Xanthophils and carotenoids are present all summer, but are, are hidden by that chlorophyll. And the tannins, the browns, are the waste products from that metabolism in the leaves. And the separation layers form when the cells develop where the leaf stem attaches to the, uh, to the tree. So it is, it is my favorite time of year. It's a favorite for, for many of you, so, so do get out. And, uh, and I'd like to thank you again for twisting my arm to do a program on <laughs> the science of, uh, of my favorite season. So I am going to um, end my program here and we can see if there's any questions. All right, great. Thank you, Dave. Um, uh, I am just checking the, I was gonna say, I didn't see anything come through bes the chat box besides um, besides that list of favorite trees in there. So lots of sugar maple, big tooth aspen, sugar maple, tamarack, aspen, stack, sumac, beech, swamp maple, red maple, sugar maple and white birch, tamarack, sugar maple, tamarack, sugar maple, hobble bush, um, oaks, red maples, um, and, and ginkgo. Um, and ginkgo. All right. <laughs> yeah, ginkgo is more of a, uh, obviously a planted tree. Um, and uh, you got to make sure you, 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 I think it's the male that you need to get. I think it's the female that really smells bad. And yeah. so I think that's all you can, uh, you can get. But uh, yeah, ginkgos do, do provide some color. Uh, nobody had our, our, our tupelo or black gum. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> that's more of a southern tree. <laughs> okay, any any questions? And you can turn the, maybe the volume on. Yes, if folks wanna wanna unmute themselves and ask the uh, ask the questions directly of Dave. Dave, one of the things that um, 
It was interesting when you were talking that struck me is it seems like a lot of the, um, you know, conditions that are ideal for fall foliage are the same that are ideal for, um, you know, the spring sap runs uh, in terms of those cold, uh, you know, the cold nights and, you know, the warm sunny days. Sure. And, and, and that is, um, that, that's, you know, very, very similar. And, uh, and again, it's that unique, um, situation that we have all of those factors that are together. There's a, there's some places in, in South America, very small areas. And there's places in, in Japan, parts of Japan and Northern China that have wonderful fall foliage, but you know, you don't get it in, in Africa, you don't get it in Australia or New Zealand and, um, in much of, um, uh, Europe, other than Scandinavia, where you have a lot of birch and aspen, it's uh, it, it doesn't have the, the richness and the longevity uh, that we have of of our our colors. All right. Does anyone else have any questions? For Dave? Do you think? Um... And because the rest of the foliage, I was over in the Adirondacks this weekend, and I saw a fair amount of uh, tamarack trees that were already turning. I mean, and I typically think of those as like late October. So, um, you know, I imagine they'll be early as well. Uh, they've, uh, Lori, they very well could be early this year. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing them starting to turn yellow more on the upland sites, um, mm -hmm. where it's a lot drier. Trees are you know, certainly a lot more stress this year than they have been in a long time. Um, and in the swamps where there's still a little bit of, of moisture, they are still staying their pretty rich uh, green yeah. color. Uh, but it's those upland sites that I'm, I'm seeing the yellowing occur. I, I have a question, but it's not on the color of the trees, but could you talk a little bit about the pests in the uh, uh, forests in northern New Hampshire and what you think that's doing to the, um, just the tree composition? Okay, and uh, that's a good question. Um, a few years ago, particularly, I, I know you um, from Randolph, where we had the um, uh, forest tent caterpillar infestations, um, and we had a lot of defoliation, particularly in those sugar maple stands, yeah. and they, would typically occur in July, early August, but we did, the leaves did recover. They're about, well, I think about a third the size and the color was was more muted in those areas. Jefferson and, and Lancaster also had it. Um, but those um, Eastern tent, forest tent caterpillar, you do get some situations, but those are naturally occurring and the trees have adapted to it. We also have a lot of the fall webworm um, and those little, they look like, you know, big spider webs up on the trees. And again, that's a natural occurrence. Those trees will, will do okay. It, uh, it, in a yard, you, you, it really kind of discolors your, your trees, but uh, they shouldn't have too much of an impact. I just don't know what the impact is going to be of sugaring uh, next spring when these trees are going into dormancy because they are so low on water. They're so stressed. I mean, the sugars that were produced you know, in large part were produced during the summer and, you know, some in September too, but uh, the trees are, are really lacking in, in water. So we may have to see how many taps you can put in a tree uh, because these, these trees may be really, really stressed out. And I, I didn't also mention the reason that we leaves fall off the trees in this part of the country. You go down south and the trees are not deciduous, which means shedding shedding of leaves. Um, you know, down there, the leaves will stay on. I mean, they'll fall off, you know, periodically, but not because of the climate. It's because there's so much moisture in, in leaves and in the, in the phloem uh, of the tree that if, if we have a severe frost where it goes down to, you know, the teens or zero degrees, uh, it's going to really damage the, uh, the structure of the tree. You'll get frost cracks and and everything else. So that's why trees go dormant. They need to take a break over the winter and they're specially adapted for that. 
hopefully that answered your question on, the, on that. No, that was good. Let me try another. What do you think the evolutionary, bene evolutionary benefit of trees like oaks holding on to their leaves for so long? Yeah, oak and beech trees, it, it, it appears, um, you know, that they're marcescent. And it appears that they're a little bit later um, arrival in the evolutionary chain. And they just haven't developed that. It's also thought that by having the leaves on the trees uh, for these species that it stops herbivory. Herbivory is a fancy word for deer or moose eating the tree. It gives it a little bit of, of protection. And um, it's also thought that, um, I'm, I'm trying to remember my tree physiology stuff, that when the leaves of oaks and beech, which have a, a high amount of tannins in them, that you get this ultraviolet radiation on these leaves that are, you know, dormant, and it tends to break it down a little bit more. So it's, it's not as powerful as it is going right into the, um, into the forest floor. So those are some of the possible ideas, but I'm not sure that, that science has all the answers on why some trees retain their leaves uh, longer. Those are some of the theories that, that I'm aware of. Thank you. And how's the foliage in the Mount Washington Valley? It's good. It's good. It's good. Uh, to, all right. To say, I mean, I know up at, we were up in Pinkham Notch on Thursday afternoon and evening, and it looked like it was, you know, really hitting, you know, sort of close to peak yeah. then. And, um, you know, and certainly I feel like the, the greater Mount the Valley itself is, you know, sort of probably hitting its stride and uh you know it'll be interesting to see come thursday uh you know if, if it knocks takes a lot of leaves to, if tomorrow's rain takes a lot of leaves yeah when you have those raindrops on the um on the leaves there's you know a fair amount of weight and then you have the wind that comes in it it knocks those mm -hmm. leaves down, down pretty well um yeah, it's it'll be interesting. Even if we get a hurricane on on through here, it's uh, it's really bad for for business. Um, but the you can go all the way down, and people are going to go down to the Smokies and the Blue Ridge Parkway and the Shenandoah area in later on in October and kind of following autumn south. Um, and it's it's something to do. All right, anything else? If you, if you do have questions, feel free. I know several of you have my email. Just ask Nora what it is. I'd be happy to try to answer your questions. And I appreciate you uh, uh, participating in this program.